morning, Giants. Welcome to Wake Up with Giants TV. I'm Ryan Morris. And as always, I'm here with your host, Nicholas T. Smith. Welcome to 2021. We made it. We made it through 2020. Holy smokes, what a ride that was, huh? I'm so excited for today's episode because if you if you feel like that you've had like some struggles and some hardships and and just needed to break through. Mm, this guest is for you. Nick, will you introduce him for us? I will. We've got Sean Michael Crane on with us. And uh, at the age of 23, uh, Sean was sentenced to seven years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And with nothing to show for his life at 23, he had a decision to make from a cell, you know, a small box. He had the ability to change his life or continue living the life he had for the first 23 years. And so this is a beautiful analogy for life because it, it really shows us that no matter what's occurred in your life, you have the ability to transform it. And so Sean, I'm really looking forward to diving into your story uh, and, and to just really sharing and getting vulnerable with you. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me here. I uh, really appreciate it and excited to share my journey and, and my story with everyone. You know, what's cool is anytime that we have a great message on, we have tech issues. <laughs> and so we know it's going to be good uh, anytime it cuts out. So am I, am I cutting out already? Yeah, it's a little delayed, but it's good. I think we're going to get the message here. And I want to make a reminder here, too. If you're if you're watching this in the comments, if you uh, if you go in and accept StreamYard's policy to show your name, then it'll show us your name when you comment. That way we don't call you just Facebook user. But please comment. If you have thoughts as Sean's talking, please share. Like we'll share that on the screen here. Uh, but Sean, where do you want to begin? If we go into your story and start, do you want to start back in your childhood? Do you want to start where you had the experience? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll touch briefly on my childhood because it's important to uh, just understand the ups and downs. I mean, the big ups and downs I went through in life um, to get me to this point. So you know, first of all, like I said, thank you guys for having me here. Um, so I'm from Santa Barbara, California, which in itself is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And to grow up here is a blessing. I mean, it's like we're in a little bubble, you know, um, L.A. is an hour and a half south. So it's not like a big city. It's a smaller community, but it's it's just picture perfect. It's beautiful. And I grew up 10 minutes away from the ocean. And so growing up as a kid, I was always out in the neighborhood playing with the other kids at the beach, surfing, playing youth sports. I played baseball, football, basketball year round. Like that was my life. And I had a lot of cousins. So I had a lot of companions, a lot of fun early in childhood, a lot of aunts and uncles in close proximity. And I, so I had so much love and support early on growing up that <clears throat> I was I was not aware of the struggles that were going on in my household. My parents were addicted to drugs and alcohol. But we lived with my dad's oldest brother, my uncle. And like I said, I had a lot of family close by. So I always had that love and guidance that I needed. But what happened was things progressively got worse in the household. And I started to become aware of the situation. As the oldest of three children, I started to have this responsibility. And I started to become aware of how drastic this, the predicament was that we were in. So at the age of 14, my freshman year, my dad was arrested in front of us really in traumatic fashion. He had a gun, the cops were there. It looked like there was gonna be a shooting and it was really just devastating. I mean, we were shocked. And so he went to prison. My mom just really became unraveled after that. They separated and she was succumbed to her own addiction and left us. So now within a matter of months, I lose my father to prison and my mother to the streets. And, you know, I love my parents dearly and they had so much love to give us, but they had their demons they were fighting. They couldn't give us that parenting, that, that love, that affection, that consistent, you know, security within our household that as children, we really needed. So that's when I just went down a completely different path in my life. I stopped surfing. I stopped going to school. I stopped hanging around any kids who I used to, to hang out with that were going good places in their lives and striving to do better. And I developed my own addiction to drugs and alcohol and, that led me down a, a really dark path. I was lost. Um, I was hopeless. I was really hurt. And internally, I didn't know how to deal with that pain. So I ran from it. I didn't go home. 
I didn't go to school and I tried to numb myself every day with drugs and alcohol for nearly a decade. That was what I did. Yeah. So let me, let me hit on that. Um, so many people run from their emotions, those dark de the demons, right? And they hide it in things, you know, and it could be anything. It doesn't even have to be drugs and alcohol. It could be addiction to your phone. It could be addiction to a person. It could be addiction to adrenaline, you know, but it's all this running away from those emotions. And so, uh, you know, just just viewing it from the outside here. So your your dad goes to prison. Your mom loses herself to drugs and alcohol. So you, you lose her to the streets. You don't know how to handle those emotions. You leave all of your friends that you used to have that were going somewhere. And then you start handling it the way that you know, in a way. Is that accurate? The yeah, way you've seen? Yeah. I, I thought that that was the only thing I could do to cope, honestly. I mean... I wasn't ready. I wasn't mature enough to face the reality of my life. Like my life was shattered in the blink of an eye and I couldn't accept that. So I didn't want to, I didn't know how to deal with it. And that was what I, what I gravitated towards to try to cope, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious, you know, for those that are viewing, you know, if you can relate to this, if you've lost yourself in that way, even later in life, it might not be when you're a teenager, it's later in life, you're feeling these deep emotions. You don't know how to handle it. And so you lean on something. Um, so what happens next in your life? Yeah. So, I mean, through adolescence, I just was drifting, you know, aimlessly with no direction. I had no future in mind for myself. Like I was just trying to exist through the day, you know, and, uh, there was so much chaos at home. I mean, my parents would come and go from prison or the streets throughout my adolescence. And it was just a constant struggle uh, of rehashing those old wounds and trying to figure out some way to, to move forward in life. And I managed to get a high school diploma. I had a lot of teachers and people who cared about me and they allowed me to go to like continuation school to get credits, just anything they could do to keep me there on the campus coming back. And I wanted to do good deep down in my heart. I wanted that life that I knew I was supposed to live, but I was afflicted, you know, and there was this other lifestyle that I started gravitating towards this other person that I was creating um, to try to protect myself. And that's how, you know, my new group of friends and everyone started to identify with me as, as like this new version of the angry Sean, the, the drug, the drug addict Sean, the, uh, the person that in my heart, I wasn't truly, but that everyone else was seeing. So, you know, after high school, I had nothing going for me and I was able to get a job with one of my dad's brothers who owned a tree service in town. And it gave me something to do. It gave me some form of hope. I would get up early every day, and I would go work hard and I learned what it meant to earn your way, so to speak. Um, yeah. I started contributing to the household. And for the first time in my life, I had pride in, in something that I was doing. I mean, for the first time since childhood. So I would wake up early and I would work really hard and I was learning, you know, the industry and uh, making money and helping take care of my family, my brother and sister. But I hadn't dealt with the underlying issues, that trauma that I went through, the pain. I was still heavily addicted to drugs and alcohol. And now I had an excuse to take, you know, more pills or drink more because my body was beat up or I was working hard and I earned it, you know, whatever excuses we find. Um, and so I was just getting deeper and deeper into that hole of addiction and to really self-loathing. Like on the outside, my friends in the community and even my family thought that everything was fine. They thought that I was doing all right for myself, but internally I was a mess. And so... Um, at this time I had a girlfriend and we had moved in together and things were good, you know, on the outside looking in, like I said, I had a decent life, but, um, she and I broke up and then I used that as an excuse to just go full bore into my old ways that I had tried to grow out of as far as like partying, going back to that old circle of friends. Um, you know, I was just really careless and this is at the age of 23. So at 23, this is the the time that my entire life changed. And um, what happened was my friend and I had decided to go to a party. We had decided to go to a party in the Mesa, which is in Santa Barbara, California, a really beautiful area on the coastline. And we didn't know anyone at this party except for a couple people. And, you know, we went there just trying to meet people. Uh, it was a Friday night. We were going to hang out there with some friends or whoever we met before we headed to downtown Santa Barbara. And you know, early on, there was an altercation between two groups of people that night. So I'm at this party. I'm just talking to, you know, strangers, 
girls, other guys just trying to have a good time. And this commotion breaks out in the kitchen. Well, one of the groups of people I had talked to earlier in the night, I knew them through mutual acquaintances. So if we saw each other from across the room, we'd say, hey, what's going on? Like we were familiar with each other. Never had spent any time with them outside of that party. Um, didn't know anything about them. The other group of guys I had never seen before in my life. So this altercation breaks out and it dies down. And everything's calm. Well, a couple hours later, I'm getting ready to leave. And that group of guys that I had had known and talked to that night, um, they're leaving too. We're going separate directions. We're both leaving the party at the same time. And as we get to the front yard, this, this group of guys they're arguing with earlier, follow us out. And now we're all face to face on the lawn. And it's apparent that there's going to be some type of commotion or a fight. Like I used to go to parties all the time as an adolescent, you know, 15, 16, 17, and we would drink and then there'd be some type of fight. And that's how the, the night would end. There would always be some type of wrestling match between two drunk guys or who knows, drama from school would get carried over in the party. And it wasn't that uncommon. I had been there a, many times before, so I wasn't alarmed by the fact that this fight was going to transpire. Um, so then the fight breaks out and it's all chaos and guys are swinging, guys are punching each other. And I'm staring across from another guy who starts approaching me. I don't know any of these people. I have no business even being out there in this, in this altercation, but the old mentality of wanting to be in the midst of these situations, drinking, losing my judgment, like all of these things led up to that moment. So now I'm standing face to face with this guy and I get tackled from the side. I get tackled by a group of people and we're moving really fast. I'm trying to hold on to somebody to prevent from falling over and we get slammed into a car and then we get slammed onto the ground. And my thought is that, okay, a group of the guys at the party or in this fight zeroed in on me and they're going to jump me. I mean, I've seen it happen before. It had happened to me in the past where you get into a, a bigger altercation, you end up getting attacked by a couple guys. So I'm on the ground now after getting slammed into a car and then on the ground, I'm holding on to that original person, just trying to protect myself. And I'm thinking any second, I'm going to start getting assaulted, kicked in the head, punched, nothing happens. So I remember thinking, okay, I don't know what's going on here. I got to get this guy off of me. And I'm trying to roll him off of me and he wouldn't budge. He was a bigger guy. I could not move him off of me. Finally, I did. And it happened pretty easily all of a sudden. And I was kind of bewildered by this whole chain of events as it happened. So I get up and my first instinct is to punch this guy because he's going to attack me. Like that's what I'm thinking is happening. So I punch him twice as I'm getting up, grazed on the side of his head. I didn't hit him hard. They, the punch is grazed, but he's laying face down. He's not getting up as I'm getting up. And I just remember thinking, okay, maybe one of my punches hit him. Like I didn't think they did. I don't know what's going on, but it's chaos. People are screaming. There's so much going on. This is happening in the uh, blink of like an eye, like seconds. My friend who had come with me to the parties in the street yelling, Sean, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I start to go over to walk to him and there's a, a street lamp and I'm limping, man, because I hit that car hard. When they tackled me, it messed up my whole lower back and leg and I still have, you know, lingering effects to this day. But I get to the street and I'll never forget this moment, you guys. I step under that lamp and he looks at me in horror. He's like, Sean, you're covered in blood. What the heck, man? And from my face to my shirt, like blood's dripping off of me, completely covered in blood. And I, I had no idea what was going on at that point. I was in complete shock. Um, I just know that now he's running up the street yelling, let's go, let's go. And there's people scattering everywhere. It's a free for all. So I start trying to follow him up the street and I'm limping. I can't even walk, man. I'm limping. I mean, to get 25 yards takes me what feels like forever. And I'm not thinking about anything. I'm just in survival mode, like trying to get out of there. Then we get up the street and he's waving me into a, a laundromat. And we go into the laundromat and he tells me, hey, take off your shirt. You're covered in blood. He had found an old shirt in the dryer, you know, and he gives me this shirt. As we're limping into the laundry room, cops are racing by on the street with their lights on down to the scene. Um, and it's just pandemonium. Like, it's crazy. Um, so he had called a cab. I don't know when he calls this cab, but this guy's waiting down the street. You know, it looked like the perfect getaway. All I know is we have to get out of there. I don't know what's going on. We get in the cab and we leave and we drive off. And so as we're driving off, you know, we're not really talking, but I'm trying to make sense of things in my head. And we get to his place that night. And I was so altered on drugs and alcohol. Like at that point, 
you know, I couldn't even function. I knew something bad had happened, but I couldn't make sense of it. So we fell asleep. We fell asleep. And next morning I woke up and it was like a nightmare that you wake up from, but you're still in, you know, it, and had it left. Like here I am trying to figure out what's going on now. Um, and I'm, I'm looking on Google, like fight at the, the Mesa. I knew that someone had been stabbed. Like I, I knew that with all that blood and the, the melee that was going on, the amount of people involved, something tragic had happened. Um, I never in a million years, you guys, in that moment thought that I was the main suspect for that stabbing. But what, what, what had happened was when the fight broke out, nobody saw the initial attack. Nobody saw the guys getting stabbed initially. They just saw me wrestling around with this guy and getting up and throwing two punches at him and him not getting up. So you have, you know, 10 people at that party telling the police who had shown up and done their investigation that, yeah, we saw Sean on top of this guy striking him and then fleeing the scene. And of course it looked horrible. Like from the outside looking in, it was pretty obvious that I was the number one suspect who had assaulted this guy. And so at that point I knew that I was going to be detained. And what I thought was going to happen was the cops were going to arrest me or, or detain me and pressure me to tell them who did it. That's what I thought was going to happen. I thought no way in a million years could they think that I did this. Everyone was there. Surely they saw I had no weapon in my hand. You know, I wasn't stabbing anyone. Two men had been stabbed that night and the individual that had been on top of me nearly lost his life. I mean, he came as close as possible to losing his life. There was rumors that they had used the defibrillators to bring him back several times in the ambulance that night. So what happened was within 24 hours, the cops came, um, you know, in dramatic fashion with the SWAT team and AR-15s and the dogs. And they arrested me at that at that house um, where I stayed, my friends, at gunpoint. And they charged me with attempted murder. So at the age of 23, here I am looking at an attempted murder. And the first thing they're telling me when they take me down to the station is, Sean, this guy's not going to make it. You know, we're going to charge you with homicide. Like they're coming at me with a lot of um, anger. They're, they're mad at me. They're making it very apparent that they think I'm their main suspect and they want to put me away forever. So that was that was a traumatic mo a moment in my life. Like I was so shocked and so numb, you guys, from all the drugs and alcohol that I couldn't even make sense of it all. Like I couldn't even process that this was actual reality. But it was like a nightmare, man, that you just don't wake up from, that you never think you'll find yourself in that moment. So the, the in a way, you recreated what you experienced with your dad in childhood with the police and the, the SWAT, and maybe. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing here a similar fashion where you're now in that same situation. I mean, a situation where I, I don't know where you're at, you know, mentally at this point, but um, there's a chance you're going you're going away to prison for a long, long time. Like your life has changed whether you want it to or not because you're in that situation. And so is that, does that sound, am I describing this accurately or am I? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that? yeah, absolutely. I was shocked and uh, I couldn't believe that my whole life was about to be over before I felt like I yeah. really got a chance to live it. And, you know, I knew that I wasn't guilty of, of the crime that they, charged me with. I didn't stab anyone. I wasn't guilty of really anything, but just stupidity and ignorance and being in the wrong place, putting myself in a really bad situation. I should have never been out there. So I didn't get upset for the fact that they were charging me with the crime. Like I never got resentful, you guys. I was more just so disappointed that I had let my life come to that, you know, that in my heart, I knew who I was and how I wanted to live, but because I couldn't deal with the pain from childhood because I had created this persona and this lifestyle to protect me and cope, that it had led me down that negative path. And here I was now at 23 with my life completely over. It was gone. You know, they were going to send me to prison for the rest of my life. And in my eyes, that was almost worse than dying because now I have to relive my pain and misery every day until I do succumb to death in a cell. You know, like it was really, it was really horrible. It was, it was really devastating. And it shocked me to the very core. I mean, it shocked me to the core in a way that I can't even describe. The first day I go to court, you know, there's all these photographers and people in there trying to take pictures of me to put on the front page of the paper in my community. You know, Sean Crane charged with attempted murder, like on the front page of the paper. And the first thing my lawyer says to me when they come up, she told me, hey, you know, they're going to amend your charges. 
the victim's brain dead. We're going to charge you with homicide. So that was the first thing I heard in court. And I was just in disbelief. I couldn't even accept it. I couldn't even acknowledge that it was reality at that point. See, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing this for our viewers and our listeners. You know, our whole goal with the book, The Giants and the Spalls, is to show that no matter where you are in your life, you have the ability to shift that. And this is one of the more extreme cases that we've had on the show um, where somebody was hurt severely. Um, you end up going to prison. Um, about five years in, they release you. And there's there's probably something around that that we could talk about. But you still had a choice to make. Even inside of prison, inside of this whole experience, you had a chance to choose your outcome, to, to decide whether that's going to be your life and you're going to spend the rest of your life that way or you're going to make a difference. And what I know about you and the ending of the story a little bit, and, it, and it's just beginning for you, I know how you chose. And that's why we have you on here. If, if this was a case of I didn't do anything wrong, it's no big deal, you know. Where's the where's the journey in that, the growth in that? Like, this yeah. is a hard topic. And and even though people might not relate to this in the case of, of homicide or attempted homicide or prison, we all have our own prisons. I've had it. I've been through it. Yeah. And that's really my message. So what I discovered early on was that I had been living my life in prison in my mind and that I had... I had acted like a victim of circumstance, you know? Yeah, I was young and I, I, I wasn't ready to deal with the things that were going on at home, but I allowed all those external events to dictate the way I live my life. So what happened early on was I stopped paying attention to the court proceedings. I knew I was going to prison. I knew they didn't believe me that I didn't do it. And I wasn't going to waste any energy or time being upset over that. I wasn't going to waste any energy or time complaining and, and saying, I'm innocent. I didn't do this. Like, why don't you guys believe me? Because you guys, what happened was I felt immensely guilty for the way I'd chosen to live my life. I felt so guilty for wasting away this precious life that we have. And that's what I was doing. I was just watching it pass me by, making excuses, never following what was in my heart. You know, I wanted to be a professional athlete and go to college and, and give back to the community and do all these things. And I had done nothing. I had done nothing. And I experienced a profound form of regret early on in that cell by myself, reflecting on the way I'd chosen to live my life. And what happened was I started to see the truth. I had nothing but time, no phones, no job, no distractions, just me in that small cell and the truth. And I started to accumulate sobriety in those first couple of months and my mind started to come alive. And I started to experience emotions inside of me that were transformative. Suddenly I saw how invaluable life was and how quickly it could be taken away. And I started to love life for the first time. I started to like want to go out and live. I, I wanted to do all the things that I had overlooked and neglected. And so this energy was coming alive inside of me that was indescribable. And my sobriety is accumulating and I'm reflecting every day and I'm realizing so much about myself and seeing things really for the first time that I couldn't see, you know, and what happened was I made a couple commitments to myself on the deepest level internally that have transformed my life forever. The first one was that I would never touch drugs or alcohol ever again. That was nine years ago. I have nine years of sobriety today. Never touch drugs or alcohol again from that moment on. The second one was that I, I made an internal commitment to myself that no matter how much time I did in prison, no matter where I went in my life, that I would give my all every day, every moment for the rest of my life to be in my true self and just being the best person that I could. I saw how quickly everything could be taken away and it scared me. And I was so disappointed in the choices that I made to get to that point that I just was going to do whatever it took to like redeem myself for me, not for society, not for other people who I'd spent so long trying to impress and do things for, but for me. So internally, I felt that inter internal peace. And at night I could lay my head on the pillow knowing that I'm doing the right thing no matter where I'm at. And what started to transpire was for the first time in my life, I started to love myself. And I started to feel proud of myself for who I was becoming. So in that small cell, all I had was a book, you know, a dictionary um, and room to work out. So what I started doing was I started every day doing small little things to better myself, whether that was writing letters back home and practicing my penmanship and my, my spelling and grammar, looking up words in that dictionary that I didn't know, reading as many books that I could, exercising every day. And I started to just treat every day like it was the only day that I had. So 
before I even go off to prison, I'm changing, I'm transforming, I'm feeling a shift internally that I can't even describe with words. And I'm trying to write letters home and tell people what's happening because it's so, it's so amazing. Like here I'm in the cement, the cement box, but I'm feeling more alive and, and better than I ever had in my life. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't I believe it. I want to pause on that. I want to hit on this because this is so valuable. What you just, I mean, you shared like 10 nuggets right there. I should have wrote them all, written them all down, but somebody will go back through and watch it. But you made a decision. The moment we make a decision, that, that, that word desidere, to cut off, right? A decision is to cut off the old life and to move forward. Now you're nine years sober. You made a decision to benefit life and you've held to it. At any point, you could make a decision to go back to that old life. It's still available to you. Yeah. Any one of us can go back to our old life. It's available to us. Then you start filling your brain with all of the good information that you can, whatever it is, you start learning. And the beauty of that is you can only draw from what you have in there. It's a bank. So if you're not putting information in it, there's nothing to draw. You just draw on what you know, right? So you start changing the information that goes in and you start putting it in. And you start working out in a box, in a box. And I've seen your body, man. And and I'm not, you know, I'm not into you at all, but damn, <laughs> dude, you were you were freaking jacked, like unbelievably ripped. And this is something that that you could do inside of prison walls. And so we all have these thoughts of I'll do it when, or if this were just right, then I can. What comes up for you around that as you hear that? Yeah. I mean, there's so much there, like you said, uh, I want to go back to what you were talking about as far as your knowledge base and education up until yeah, that yeah. point, I hadn't done anything to, to learn, to educate myself. And I really thought I just wasn't very intelligent. I thought I had some street smarts and I was good at interacting with people. I had a lot of social skills, but when it came to book smarts and stuff of that nature, I was just not there. That's what I thought because I would write letters home and I would get letters back of people correcting my spelling. And I felt embarrassed by that. I mean, here I'm 23 and I can't even write a proper letter back home. And I had a cellmate at the time and I would ask him how to spell all these different words. And, you know, I could tell he's probably kind of getting a little irritable. Like, come on, man. You know, um, one day I asked him and out of the corner of my eye, I see something flying over towards me. It's this little pocket dictionary. It hits me in the shoulder. He said, look it up. And I was like, what? Look at, you know, <laughs> at first I didn't know how to take that. But in my head, I'm like, OK, watch, I'm going to prove to you and everyone. And so from that moment on, I looked up every word in that dictionary. I completely transformed the way I could write and speak and everything about my, my intellect, really. Like I started to see that if I did apply myself, I was able to learn and to change, right? Because we think we're stuck a certain way. So it just yeah. started with me writing letters and, and writing those letters to the best of my ability, as if they're going to be published in the New York Times. And people started commenting back like, hey, Sean, your writing's getting really good. And we could tell you're you're trying, you know, and every book I read, any uh, word I didn't know, I'd write it down. I would quiz myself at the end of the week, like I'm in fifth grade, in the jail cell, right? All my vocabulary words. Uh, and I started to change the way I could speak. I, I felt my mind coming alive and, and I was able to think much more clear and quicker than ever before. And this is what gave me the confidence when I did go to prison to enroll in the correspondence program they have there to earn a college degree. If I had not taken these steps early on, I still would have had that limiting belief. Oh, I'm not very smart, right? I'm, I can't do it. And that would have really limited me in what I was able to accomplish in prison. But in prison, I got four college degrees, all AA degrees, because that's all they give you access to. But I, I learned everything I could. Every day, I had something positive to do for myself. Every day, I'd study and writing, reading to do, and it opened up this whole new world for me. So. That's what started happening to me in that cell. I became willing, willing to just go for it. This is what I mean when I say give your all, like everything across the board. My workouts, I would work out until I couldn't even move, man. Like we had this little area where you can't even both do push-ups in the cell at the same time. I go down, then I get up and he goes down. But this is all we have. This is the only thing we have to construct some type of positive energy and feelings of like I'm doing it, right? I'm taking care of myself. I'm doing what I can in here to better myself. So, of course, we're going to give our all to those workouts to the point where a thousand squats and a thousand push ups in an hour became just average. That became just like just enough. Right. Um, and this is what I mean. Like every day became so valuable. There was not one day that I overlooked in there. So 
going through those eight months in the county, by the time I was going off to prison, I was ready. I was going into it with the mentality that I was going to do whatever I had to to avoid trouble, avoid conflict, maintain this positive mindset that I'd started to create and just do anything constructive every single day to better myself because I was already seeing beyond prison. I knew when I came home that I wanted to have a good life, that I wanted to make an impact. And I was seeing what was possible with my effort, which was so transformative for the way that I viewed myself, my self-identity. Because before that, you know, I, I doubted myself. I hadn't proven it to, to me. I didn't prove what I can do and accomplish because I wasn't taking action. So yeah, leading up to prison, I, I went into my time in prison that five and a half years with a completely different mindset than the individual who had come into the county jail just months prior. That's interesting that you talk about that because like in my mind, I think that it would be so easy and that the majority for sure probably goes in and just, you know, they might do their, you know, exercise or whatnot, but to actually to sit down and then to, to build that discipline and to go through what you did, it's probably, I would imagine it's rare uh, that, I, I don't know if I, I, I've never been to prison, but that's I, I mean, it would be so easy just to say this is my circumstance. You know, eh, I'm here. So, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, curious on on the towel. I'm curious on that, too. So adding to that, Ryan, just the idea. My kids are watching. They, they would love the show 60 Days In, right, where they take common people. They put them in jail for 60 days. What you see is a lot of people become their environment. They yeah. just become the environment and they fit in. And, and within that prison environment, there's this idea that I've, I'm a victim, you know, they're victims. Yeah. And, and here you are. Yeah. Can you talk to that? Can you speak to that? Like yeah. how did you stay Absolutely. focused on what you wanted inside of the environment that it was? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, 99% of people that go into that environment leave worse off. Um, it's just tragic to see what happens. What happened to me early on, it's because of the severity of my charges, you guys. If I would have been in there for a DUI, it wouldn't have had the same impact. But I'm looking at my entire life, losing my life. Like that, what that did to me on an internal level, all these guys are going in there for a year to two years, three years. They're getting out. They're not even really sweating it. They're like, okay, I go in here, um, you know, play some cards, hang out with the fellas, and then I get to go home in a year, back to my old lifestyle. It's not enough to wake them up. But I'm looking at 10, 20, 30 years in prison, and it's shocking me to the core. And I'm just like, God, give me another chance. Like, I'll do whatever it takes. So early on in my, my own mindset, I said, I'm not going to ever be a victim. I'm not going to. I was sick of doing that. I was doing that my whole life, blaming society, blaming my parents, blaming everyone. But it was harming me. I was the one being affected. So early on, to not find you know fault with the judge, the DA, the witnesses, the police force, like, to not blame them for wrongly incarcerating me, that was huge. I never went there once in my mind because I knew that would waste so much energy and take away from this monumental challenge that I had to face, which was my redemption, overcoming this time in prison, like this environment, right? So immediately seeing the people, feeling that negative energy, energy seeing the way that day-to-day, -day, like the interactions were in there, I had to, to put myself in the most positive place mentally, I'd have the most focus, everything I did, every second counted. Because you have a negative interaction with someone, it turns into a fight real quick. And now you're looking at more time or, or getting hurt or who knows what happens. It's a negative outcome. So what happened for me, because some of my family members growing up and myself included, started to go down that negative path um, and that lifestyle, that wasn't me in my heart. But I had chosen that route. We talked about that earlier, why I chose to go that route. But in my heart, that wasn't me. And I never I never felt right like acting that way or being in those situations with my old friends and associates. So when I got to jail and I was surrounded by hundreds of these guys, um, I was repulsed by this place. Like that wasn't who I was. I, would, I didn't want to be OK with being there. I didn't want people to look at me and say, oh, yeah, Sean, like he fits in over there. I wanted to do whatever I could to not be placed in that category because that's not who I was in my heart. I wanted to be a good person, contribute to society, help people. Like this is what was in my heart. And I discovered that, you know, sitting in that cell, the truth came right, you know, forth before me. Like I could see the truth. This is not what you want, Sean. This is not who you are. So yeah, a lot of people are negative in there and it's easy just to fit in with the crowd.
But I knew that to do that would just cause so much harm for the rest of my life. And I would never be able to, to get back, you know, and to do the things that I wanted. So it was a, a choice early on that, you know, it's, you don't really see a lot of people do it because it's hard to, to stand out in that way. Like it's hard to, to not fit in. Right. I think we're growing up in school and in society in general, we always want to fit in and be accepted by our peers Yeah, the same thing yeah. in prison, but all the stuff that, they want you to do to fit in is all negative. It's drug use. It's violence. It's negative self-talk, negative thinking. Like it's just every day would have been, every day would have been so horrible. Every day would have been just devastating to live like that. And I couldn't do that to myself. I think of that term, the acceptance, you know, that's one of the biggest things we all pursue is acceptance. And it, even in my journey, there's this idea that at, at some degree, I want to be accepted. Right. Um, but what what really drew people in was me not fitting in. You know, I, I was doing videos. Uh, I had a conversation this morning with a, a fantastic tribe member, a, a giant, uh, Debbie Martinez Clark. I'll give her a shout out here. And she said, you know, what, what was really drawing was that you were doing videos out of your brother's basement bedroom, you know, recently divorced, life was shitty, and you were talking about it. And, um, like stuff like this, like if I were to fit in, I wouldn't have shown that side of my story for acceptance uh, with yours. I mean, you're out there, you've got a book now. I mean, you're out there doing videos daily and you're owning, you're taking ownership of your life the way it is outside of acceptance, outside of concern for how others might view you. And that's what I, that's why I wanted you on this show so badly is because it's another view of, um, we, we have these judgments about things like this. We have these judgments. Oh, you went to prison. You're automatically a terrible human. We can no longer accept you back into society because you went to prison. And, and I see it differently with you. I see what you're doing and you're making a positive impact. You're showing people what's possible. You're inspiring people with your story. All outside of acceptance, I write fit out, right? Instead of fit in, <laughs> like go be the odd duck. I mean, it's a little weird way to say that, but that's what you're doing. Um, you're fitting out. And uh, man, I just, I, I, I can see this for so many people in our tribe of, we want to hide our life. You know, we compare, there's a meme that says we compare our backstory to somebody's highlight reel. And, and we don't want them to see what life is really like on the, on the back end of our lives. And, and that's the power that all that stuff is the power that helps you to move forward. If you'll just own it. Yeah. What comes up yeah. for you? With that? Yeah. I mean, I was exhausted by the time I got to that jail cell. Um, being this person that I truly didn't feel aligned to in my heart and doing everything for everyone else, codependent relationships, friends, what you just spoke about, acceptance. It was draining me, man. Every day of my life, I was living as this person that I didn't want to be. And I was stuck and I didn't know how to get out of that. So by the time I found myself in the cell, I was just relieved in a way. Like, wow, I don't have to do that anymore. I can be my true self. And the more I did it, the better I felt. And it didn't matter that I was in jail. Here I was having a new opportunity to live life in accordance with what I felt in my heart. And that was revolutionary for me. I never thought that that was possible. I never knew how I could start that because I always worried about what people would think. Oh, Sean, what if you decide to go to city college and play football, right? One day I thought about that. We had a pickup game at the beach with some of my old friends. I saw them down there and I played with them and I had a great game and I was the best player out there. And they're like, Sean, why didn't you play with us in high school, man? We missed you. We could have used you, you know? And they're like, you should go play at city college. You could still play. And in that moment, in my heart was saying, yeah, go, like you could still do it. But then the next day, the fear, the self-doubt surfaced. And I thought about, well, what is my family? What are all these people going to think about if I, who am I to go off and just play football now after neglecting myself in high school? And it was that type of thought process that had me stuck in life, um, the fear, the self-doubt. So yeah, I can relate to that so much. And you said something else that was really important. Like when we compare ourselves to others. And we maybe we don't like yeah. the way that that makes us feel. So number one, we always are competing with someone, ourselves. Who are we yesterday, last week? Who do we want to be? And what are we going to do about that? And if we don't like the comparison, like what I've found, honestly, 
is a lot of times we hold back, man. We're capable of so much more. If we don't feel comfortable with our, our highlight reel, well, then why not? Let's make it amazing. Like we have this one life to live and we're capable of so much more. If we get up every day and we just give our all and we're striving to do the things in life that we truly want to do, you're going to make the most unforgettable memories. You're going to make the most amazing highlight reel ever. And it's for you and you only, nobody else. It's for you to know that I didn't leave anything on the table. I didn't hold back. I'm giving my all to this life, making those, those memories, traveling, giving back to others, like whatever it is that you want to do that's important to you and your heart. That's what we have to be pursuing in life, man. I was challenged the other day to create my dream life, a day, a dream day, right? The ultimate yeah. day. And what's surprising is that it's way more affordable than I thought it would be. Yeah. But what was costly is all of the things I would say of like you, like, who am I? Right. That question, like people will say that question and not in a positive state. You know, it's it's almost always a negative of who am I to do this thing? Right. Mm -hmm. Not who am I? Well, I'm a motherfucking giant. Excuse <laughs> me, you're going to have to bleep that out later. Ryan. <laughs> uh, it's 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 one of those things that we we can stand in our power. Don't leave anything on the table. You know, just. Your, your dream day, the life you want to live is probably more attainable than you think if you'll just do it. Um, but we tell ourselves all the reasons why we can't, you know, and this goes back to the book. There's a part that says that. See, smalls tell themselves all the reasons why they can't become a giant. And it's time for us to start doing the things that show us that we can. Your dream life is way more attainable than you'd ever know. And you're proving that you're proving that from a prison cell, you're proving it, you know, you're not there anymore. Just to be clear, you know? Yeah, no, <laughs> I've, been, I've been home for only three years, but let me touch on that. Cause that's such yeah. an important topic. And I think that's one of like the most profound topics in our world right now is fear and self doubt on one side versus uh, our natural intuition and desire on the other side. So a lot of times we make a decision based on fear and self doubt right? Over and over and over. Like we had this desire to do something. This was me for my whole life. Sean, go play college or go play sports, go sign up at school. Ah, I can't do it. Like, what are people going to think? What if I'm not good enough? Um, Sean, you should stop doing drugs and alcohol, like get yourself back on track. Uh, like it's always this dilemma. And the yeah. more I'm reinforcing the self doubt and fear, well, of course, that's what's going to transpire within my life. Those are the results that I'm creating. And that decision-making process is going to feel more natural than, than pursuing what we want in our heart. But we can flip that switch. It takes one decision to follow in accordance with that intuition. And then suddenly you realize, wow, the, the world didn't crumble. Like I'm still alive. I can make a decision to follow my heart and do something challenging and it's okay. Yeah, right? It's okay. I can do it. I can do this. And that thought process is so powerful because a lot of people reinforce that other thought process to like, I'm not good enough. I can't do it. You know, and um, the decision is is ours to, to make. And so yeah. you talk about like creating your dream life. It starts with one decision. And the more that we make a decision in our favor, we have that intuition. We listen to it and we follow through with action. Next time around, that's going to be an easier process, an easier decision to make. And this adventure that we're on, this journey, it's a series of small decisions. People think that the big mansion, the million dollars in the bank account, you know, all of this, this lavish lifestyle is the end result that we're seeking. It's not. It's the, the fulfillment and the internal peace and self-love come from making the decision in your favor. Okay. You feel so good about yourself for doing that. Yeah. That that's the feeling. That's the feeling that I experienced in jail. I thought I needed this redemption. I, I needed to come home and do all these things in order to find that internal peace and self-love. As soon as I started doing push-ups in the cell and looking up words in the dictionary, I figured it out. I figured it out. And from that moment on, my life has never been the same. Okay. I got to hit on I got to pause you, man. Like, cause I know <laughs> you can, you can offload and download a ton right here. Um, you, you talked about intuition just br briefly. Okay. Intuition is our inner knowing based on the information we put into here. And it's an automatic behavior. If you think of the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, or you look at heuristics, all we're doing is we're creating mental calculations based on what we know. 
So if the information that's in there is faulty, your intuition is going to be off. And so the more information you're able to put in, the more you have to draw from. So when you go to that intuition, you can quickly access that information without having to pull it up fully and make a decision because you have access to that information. So what you put in matters for your intuition. And the other thing is like, and I hope I can find my way back to what I was going to say here. I don't know. I might've lost it here. The series of small decisions. Um, it, it really is this commitment. I think I wrote it down here. Uh, yeah, I think I've lost it anyway. No, I know what it is. The feelings, pay attention to the feelings because you talk about the feeling that you had in prison. You probably had a million thoughts going on, but the feeling that you had is what anchored you in that emotion. And, and I use the analogy now of a tree, right? If you, if you picture the feeling as the trunk of the tree, and every branch and leaf that comes off of that is a thought that if you were to cut down the tree, all of the thoughts tied to that tree would go with it, right? What we tend to do is we focus on the leaf. And if I could just get this one thought under control, then I'll do that. But when you focus on the trunk, the leaf comes along automatically. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's I like, like that when you focus on the feeling, when you focus on that feeling, and you can handle that feeling and really sit with it. And that's where the numbing comes in is people don't want to feel that feeling. They want the thought to go away, but they won't sit in the feeling. The moment you can sit in that feeling in a way, if it's a negative thing, you're chopping that tree down. And every thought that's ever tied to that feeling goes with it. It's the way our bodies are designed. We have a limited number of feelings. We have an unlimited number of thoughts. And so when you can handle the feeling, or you can anchor in that feeling of what I want to create. Oh man, all the thoughts that will support that come in. They flood yeah. in. What, what do you, what do you think? I'd love to hear your thoughts around that. What comes yeah. up? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's profound and it's true. And to go back to what you said about intuition, right? Yeah. What I discovered. So this was a, a novel experience for me. I was so detached from like that. When I say intuition, what I describe is these, that little whisper in the back of your head that says, Sean, go do this, man. It's good for you. You know, you want to, right? Um, Sean, go out and like, I always uh, use the go, go for the sports team, um, get sober. Like there was always this voice inside that was trying to get me to live a better life for myself. But every time there was also a voice that was trying to hold me back. Oh, you don't need to do that. Oh, like an excuse, a fear-based decision. So what I found in yeah. my jail cell was when I started paying attention to these two polarizing thoughts um, and, and really paying attention to like, well, if I continue to listen to the fear and doubt, what life is that going to lead me to? Like, what path is that going to lead me down if I keep doing this? Or I can listen to this, this new thought and feeling that's like really wants me to do better. Like this is the side of me that wants to excel and wants to live an amazing life. Imagine if I started actually following through with actions to uphold those, those thoughts. Right. And so when I use the word intuition, that's what I describe. What I found with a lot of people is that if you sit down and talk to someone, they all know what they should be doing. We all know we have this moral compass that's just built in within us. But how many people are actually consistently following that, that guideline every day through their actions? Most people might do it sometimes. Some people never do. And they're always listening to the fear and doubt, the self-defeating thoughts, the limiting beliefs. That's that polarizing, you know, good versus bad or however you want to describe it that I became very aware of. And honestly, since that moment, I've continued to just follow that, that moral compass and it's paved a whole new path and created a whole new lifestyle for me. To the so point how, where, would, how would you suggest like somebody that's at home listening and saying, okay, yeah, well, you know, you, it was easy for you because you were inside of a cell. There's no other obligations, no other things to do. Can you, right. Can you, can you hear that though? I mean, how often do we say that? Oh, it's easy for you because you went to prison. Yeah. Right. No, Where's I love this. This is it. Right. Yeah. yeah. This yeah. is a great question. They'd be like, oh, you had is... nothing else to do. You didn't have kids running around, bills yeah. to pay, all this other stuff. So, yeah. Of it, course, it, you it, that's a great question. It, you know, or decide, you know. That's a great question. I tell people a lot of times, hey, I was like blessed. It's e It was easier for me to change my life than people out here because I had nothing but time, no distractions. And then I discovered this blueprint to change my life. And that's what I turned. I turned the steps that I went through in prison into my coaching program. So how do you teach a busy 
father of three, entrepreneur, working 10 hours a day. How do you create more time in this day to do these things? It's impossible. These are the guy, the men that I'm working with right now to help answer that question. So I love that you asked me that. We need to put ourselves in a place where we can connect to this energy. We can connect to this, what I call intuition, right? Yeah. These yeah. answers. These answers will surface when you reduce stress and you reduce the noise. So that's why I'm a big proponent of the morning routine. I teach my guys or anybody I work with or talk to that we need to be up at least an hour to 90 minutes before we have one obligation to do to do nothing. I mean, I have a specific protocol, but for me, I get up at 3.30 because my daughter wakes up at 5.30. She needs dad to feed her breakfast and to be ready to help my wife and my children. So I get up at 3.30 and I just sit there and reflect the same thing I did in my cell. I pay attention to the to the feelings and the thoughts that are surfacing. And I don't have a phone near me. I don't have like things I have to go do. I don't have anything. And you'd be amazed that when you do that, what starts to surface within your self-talk, this, this epiphany out of nowhere, a thought, you know, a novel thought. Um, so I teach anybody that I work with the same process of an early morning rise, no distractions, meditation, then journaling, and then some, some form of physical movement. Because those are the three things that I would do every day in my cell before I even engage with other people to be at my best, to be mentally so focused and aware, right? To be internally just at peace because now I'm getting up early and have time for myself. And you have this internal dialogue that starts to take place day by day by day. And you start to get to know yourself in a different way. You start to see things differently. Suddenly you're tapped into that creative uh, energy that gets bogged down by stress and go, go, go mentality. When we're on the go all the time, we're closed off to what people call like infinite intelligence or creative ideas. Um, for me, I get them every day still because I'm up and it's quiet and there's no noise and I'm meditating and I'm reflecting on that. And then I'm writing down stuff that came to me in my meditation and it's continuing this process of introspection. Like it's a whole world that just opens up within. Then it's I go almost, on a run. It's almost backwards I, because you, like in your head, you think, oh, I got to grind, 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 grind to get ahead. Yeah. Which is really, Nick, Nick talked about this the other day with me that, you got to slow down to speed up, to slow down, to get the, to get that, uh, that movement that, uh, so sometimes, uh, that's amazing. Sometimes too, though, like having a conversation with somebody like you, Sean, uh, when I do my coaching calls, it's the same thing. It's, it's, you have a chance to really hear what you're saying. Like yeah. we, we go and we see our life a certain way and we have this perception of what life is. And then we share that with somebody else and they tell us what they heard us say. And it's like, wow, what the hell am I doing? And you know what to do intuitively, you know what to do to correct it. I mean, there's not much outside of us supporting them and being clear around that. And, and in a way it's um, being a support, but not, not rescuing them from their situation. It allows them to recognize that they already have the power within them. They just need to hear it. They just need to hear it. Yeah. No, I'm so glad you said that. I mean, I tell anybody I work with or talk to like, hey, you already have the answers. You have all the answers. You're just not aware of them yet. So whether that's saying something out loud that changes yeah. the way we perceive it or getting feedback and getting this like paradigm shift in that moment. Um, so that's so powerful what you said. I'm glad you shared that. And then combining that with daily reflection, writing, which is such a powerful tool to illuminate these things. Like I would be in my cell, you guys, meditating and then writing. And I was discovering worlds within worlds that I never was even aware of, like about myself and ideas and this amazing energy. And so I was able to tap into that every day. So for people out here who are busy, the responsibilities don't go away, right? The grind, grind, grind is going to deplete us and we're going to be so drained and we're going to be irritable, angry, upset. That's why people get depressed or, you know, turn to alcohol at the end of a long day or divorce, like all these things transpire from stress and our inability to manage it. Right. So we have yeah. to get up earlier and give yourself time. And people think, well, get up earlier. How can I do that? I'm drained. Like I, I do so much in the day, but you'd be so surprised that when you get up earlier and you have a consistent sleep and wake time, how that shifts your circadian rhythms and how your energy is actually going to be more sustainable throughout the day. And then when you're doing things like meditation, journaling, exercising daily, you're going to, you're investing in yourself. You're doing things that improve your energy levels, not deplete them like a bank account, right? Now you're doing these things every day that are like deposits versus just drain, drain, drain yourself every day and expect that you can make it work. It's not sustainable. 
Sean, I'm feeling ripped off, man. We're only <laughs> we're only getting a billionth of what you know. Like <laughs> it's uh, it, it's it's amazing. I seriously, I feel like we could go on for hours. And this is where your book's going to come in. And and if people aren't following you, we're we're going to recommend they do. You know that they come see your story because it's inspiring. I mean, there's so many things that we we put off. Like if I only had a workout partner, then I would do it. If you'll hold me accountable, then I'll do it. Well, what happens when you're in a box by yourself? I love the show Alone on on uh, Hulu or Netflix because these guys are out on an island by themselves and there is nobody coming, nobody coming to rescue. If they're going to rescue themselves, they got to do it. If they're going to have a conversation, it's going to be with themselves. And you talk about a tough game is when they get, they can have all the survival skills in the world, but when it comes to the mental and really facing and knowing you, Oh my God, dude, they drop off like flies. Like ah, that's too scary. I want to go back home where it's safe. Yeah. We are our solution. Like when you sit and journal, you get a chance to have a conversation with yourself and your higher potential. And you start to have these, these downloads in a way of ideas. Like you say, you see worlds on worlds on worlds. This, this goes above and beyond any beliefs. It, it, it incorporates all these beliefs. It's like when you tap into your intuition and your higher knowing and your wiser self or your God or source or universe or whatever you want to call it, it really takes you slowing down and, and having that walkabout in a way, or that, you know, like we don't have these rituals in our culture so much where you go out and you're isolated. You know, Jesus went to the desert for 40, 40 days by himself. You imagine the conversations you start having with yourself. If you're in the desert alone, you're going to discover some things. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Isolation and time to reflect is so powerful. Even if we did it for an hour a day or on the weekend, you just go on a hike or something. That's why I run in the mornings, man. I get up and I meditate and journal and run. So now for two, three hours sometimes, I'm up here just playing stuff over, talking, um, having that internal dialogue, connecting to that source. You know how many times I'll go on a run and get an idea about you know, a video to do, a training to do? Like Everything is based on that morning routine. I don't have to have a content planner. I don't have to have copyright or, you know, people like that. It all comes to me and then I just apply it. And that's what's been happening for the past five to eight years. And it's amazing that when I say my path has been like unveiled before me and I just follow it, I use this analogy. Like my path is just being laid out before me. My job is just to give my all every step of the way. Like the path is there. I just have to do everything to the best of my ability. Um, and that's, that's what I do. So you said something a second ago, too, that really caught my attention. A lot of people say, oh, I'll work out when. Um, it's, it's the first of the year, what, a couple of days ago. So New Year's resolutions might be big right now. I'll do this when or New Year's resolution. But what most people don't have is a clear vision and image of who they want to be in five or 10 years from now. Like, can you give me complete detail about the, the band or individual you want to be in five years? If I ask people that, they might have a, an idea. But can you like... Can you write it out to the point where I can see it clearly? And most people can't. And then they get scared or they feel bad about that. Like there's something wrong with them. And that's not the case at all. They just haven't sat down and taken the time to do it. Yeah. So this is honestly one of the first steps I do with anybody that I start working with is vision, creation, and connection. What do you want and why do you want that? And let's write it out to the point where there's no limitations. You write these words on this paper and it's going to come to life. What would you write, right? What would you write if you knew that they would come to life no matter what? And that breaks down the barriers. Early on, we need to go into it with that free thinking because then we can tap into, like you said, what you really want in your heart and start to put it on paper. And it's a lot easier to make a roadmap and give you the tools and resources to get there when we know what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. And well, not only just seeing it, connecting with it, feeling, feeling it. That's why it's creation and connection because- if we're not emotionally attached to that person, we have to be like you guys. When I was in that cell, I had to become the person I am today more than I wanted to breathe there. Like I had to. It was that important to me because I'm in a cement box and my life's taken from me. So if we can even create half of that emotional connection to this newer person and lifestyle we want to be and and think of things like for our kids, for our wives, like who's it for? Right. And really 
to the point where when you talk about your future life, you get tears in your eyes because it means so much to you. Like you get chills through your body because you have to have it because to go back to that old lifestyle to keep doing what you're doing, it's just a death sentence. Like you want this new life so bad. If we can create that in somebody, they it's over. They're going to transform their life because the 4 a.m. wake up call when your alarm goes off. Now you have a tool. You have something in your favor. Yeah, it's early and I'm tired. But what about my wife and kids? What about my diabetes? What about my heart condition? Like we have to go there every day. I don't want to go to the gym, man. I'm tired and it's probably crowded. I have to wear a mask. Wait, what about my hypertension? What about my, what my doctor said? Like we have to have that bigger picture that's going to take us out of the moment where we're going to seek comfort and pleasure, right? And delay and delay the gratification for something more, for something greater. I love it, man. We're we're already at the hour. I mean, that went by fast. I know, man. Uh, so let me ask you, I'm going to ask you just a kind of combo question here. If you were to go back in time and give yourself one piece of wisdom, what would that be? And for our viewers, what piece of wisdom would you share for them for their journey? So kind of a combo there. Yeah, it's probably the same thing, man. Like I'm very focused on this dilemma. When you're making decisions every day, are you making them out of fear and doubt? And what is that going to get you? Because every time you give in to the fear and doubt, you're reinforcing that thought process, right? And it's easier to stay in your comfort zone and listen to that fear and doubt. But what life is that going to lead you to live? And is that what you want? Like, do you want to look back on your life one day thinking, oh my gosh, I could have done things way differently, right? Yeah. That regret will eat you alive. And that's what happened to me. So on the other hand, in your heart, you know who you want to be and what you want to do every day. I would tell my younger self, Sean, like, you know what you want to do. Why are you holding back? These decisions are going to lead to massive regrets one day. And you're not going to be able to go back and live differently. But right now you have a choice. And when you make the decision in favor of that person you truly want to be, that's where the fulfillment, that's where the internal self-love stems from. You don't even need to achieve the end result. Just taking those first steps and starting to move towards it, you're going to feel an energy inside of you that's indescribable and it will transform your life. So just start being it. Start doing it, right? 100% though, not sometimes. It has to be like, this is the new person you're creating. Are you going to kind of create this new version of yourself? Because if you kind of do, it's probably not going to work. But if you want to create this new version of yourself, because you have to have that. Because to live in this inferior manner, you know, is something that you can't stand to do any longer. Like that, that mental decision, right? That all or nothing mentality. I mean, you don't have to go out and run 100 miles or um, sign up for like, some extreme event and like just completely change your life. But it's, it's that thought process, man. It's transformative. This, this is incredible. You know, and we're, we're running short on time here. Are you okay for just a minute more? Yeah, man. We'll be, we'll be efficient. Yeah. Um, Ryan, what, what thoughts do you have as we recap this real quick? Now, just going back through, it's, it's interesting to me <clears throat> that there's, there's almost the same pattern with with the giants that rise up that that uh, they see kind of where they're at in their giants journey. They they discover they want something different or more. And they start going down a different yeah. path, and then they have they have to take those small daily steps to get to where they, you know, um, um, where they want to go. There's almost always that moment of like like oh okay I'm, now I'm now I'm in, like enlightened a little bit when I and I I'm not not quite giant, but I'm not quite small. And they have to really now make another focus choice to move forward and push through it. And then, um, man, it's it, to, to watch like every single giant that comes on here do almost the same thing in <clears throat> all kinds of different circumstances, you know, drug addiction, yeah, prison, yeah. you know, wheelchair. We've seen, we've seen, just about everything. I don't, I don't know what else we, there's, there's probably a lot more, there's it's tons really of more, yeah. there. but they don't let that just define them or stop them. It might have for a little while, but then they have that awakening and then they push through and they, and they rise to the occasion. And uh, I'm telling you giants at home that are watching, look, if these guys can do this stuff, I mean, there's so much against, I mean, really, if you look at it, he had every, every reason to, to, to not succeed. I mean, he's in freaking prison, uh, facing life in prison. 
Like that's a that's a big deal. Uh, and yet he he made choices, and then those choices made him just consistent daily effort over and over and over again. And yeah. uh, look at look at the results that have that have happened. And I'm sure you know what now you're at a now you're at a, a spot wherever you are in your journey, and you're probably looking at the next the next mountain to climb. You know, and some people would look at, at where you're at and go, man, that's wow, that's way up there. That's amazing. But as you grow, you you see new new opportunities. You you have new goals, new dreams, new visions of where you want to be. Uh, so you just kind of keep yeah know, spiraling up is what we call there's, it. There's no limit to your giantness. You know, it's yep. it, if you look at this story and if you haven't read the book yet, go get the copy of the book. And Sean, we're going to send you a copy as a gift for being a guest here and a shirt. So after we're done, if you'll get us an address, we'll get that to you. Um, but the book, the whole premise of the book is that we all have, we all start out pretty equal, pretty small, right? We have this slate that's kind of blank where we can grow into anything we want. And then we take on our culture, whatever that looks like, or our environment, and we start to think that's the way it is. But then we have this awakening that says, hey, there's, there's a possibility of something more. And you hit on every point of this book, every single one, that you had an awakening, you had a culture that that um, you lived into before you had that awakening. So you had some beliefs that were foundational that you could have lived into that you didn't. You said, there's got to be more for me. You go out on a path and you don't see the path clearly. You just put energy into it, just like our, our character in the story. And then you meet up with giants along the way, either through learning, through books or whatever, or people. And then you stand on their shoulders and you start to see there's more for you. Your cellmate throwing a dictionary at you and saying, look it up is a giant move. It's like, dude, you have the ability to look it up. Start learning for yourself. That's what giants do. And then you work hard to create the life that you have. And not only that, you want to go back and help other people who are playing small lives to live into giant lives. Like you hit on every point and your book is going to be impactful. And I want people to watch for it. I've got your, your website going across the bottom here. Prison so of prison of your own, right? That's the name of the, the book. Yeah, it'll be available uh, next week, January, about January 12th. It'll be available on Amazon. Perfect. I can't wait to buy a copy. I'm going to get one. So yeah, for I'm sure. I, I love this. Is there anything else that you feel you need to share for the show today? Well, I just want to thank you guys for having me on here. And of course, this is a topic, like you said, we could continue on and on with. Um, but for anyone just listening, I mean, at one point I was a drug addict sitting in a jail cell with nothing. I was at rock bottom. I had nothing. And, you know, I found within myself the ability to continue fighting to change my life. And it was just a daily process. But you know, there's hope for anybody. I know this has been a tough year, 2020 was, and going into this year, there's still a lot of adversity out there. But just know that you are so capable to overcome these things. And imagine the person you will be in the future having overcome the pandemic and, you know, these challenges that we're facing, like it's going to sharpen you and make you a better version of yourself. So if you ever doubt yourself, if you ever don't feel like you can like do the things in your life you want, just know that I promise you can. If I could do it and change my life from a prison cell right now in this moment, you can start to change your life too. Amazing. There's nothing. I don't, I don't know how I'll stand that. That's perfect. So Giants, go make it a giant day. Thanks for being a part of this show. Continue the comments in the comments section and we'll share this and uh, we will see you on the next episode. Thanks for being a part of this. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, guys.